Our next speaker is from the 33rd District. He's a state senator and uh, he's going to be running for the U.S. Senate in the upcoming election. Let's give it up for Mr. Chuck Ferguson. Thank you. Thank you very much. And thank you for coming today. You know, it's great to be, be here with people that care about the direction that their country's going. You know, as, as I travel throughout the state, there's two things that I think that people are really looking for. And that's one, number one is leadership, and number two is just someone to simply tell them the truth. The truth about what's going on in our country today. You know, if you look at, look at the, the financial stability of our country, the unfunded liabilities, this is a dirty little secret that no one in Washington wants to talk about, but what are the unfunded liabilities of promises that the federal government has, has already made is $55 trillion of unfunded liabilities. That's promises the government has already made to its citizens that it has to fulfill. $55 trillion. If you want to break that down, <clears throat> that's $200,000 for every family in America owes on that public debt right now. If you want to break it down even further, a family of four, $50,000 each. You know, one of, the, one of the tea parties I went to, there was, a, there was a child with a sign up that said, I haven't started kindergarten yet, but I'm $38,000 in debt. You know, and that's a sad fact in this country. And what, what we have to do is have people stand up and, tell, and simply tell the truth, that we are broke financially as a nation. And unless we get back to our financial ground, foundations, and, and get this country back into shape, we can't survive as a nation. And that is the number one policy of this administration and this government, is to get us back on a sound financial footing. You and your household cannot be successful. You can't survive if you can't survive financially. And what we do, we've got to get back to, the, to, to our foundations. You know, I went out and worked for a lot of Republican candidates because we were told that if we ever get the House, the Senate, and the presidency, we can set forth a conservative agenda for America. Well, in 2002, I believe, we accomplished that. And what happened? Our leaders forgot where they came from. They forgot their principles that, that, that they run on. You know, the, the foundation, the top two planks in the Republican Party is a balanced budget, no earmarks. What happened? What we did was is we sent a bunch of people up there that became part of Washington, not part of what, who sent them up there. The people across, across the state of Missouri and across every state in the nation. They forgot where they came from. And what we have to do is begin the process of sending people up that just stand on their principles, that stand on, on the philosophy of smaller government and what, what made this country great. You know, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna, I'm gonna to confess something to you. I actually have never been to Washington. You know, it might, might come as quite a shock, but you know, you think about a lot of things. There was a lot of soldiers in 1940 that had never been to Europe. There was a lot of them that had never been to North Africa. There was a lot of them that had never been to the Philippines. But what they did was they went and they did a job. And what we've got to do is start sending people that aren't part of Washington, but they live here. I live here in Missouri. And we've got a job to do, and that's the way we need to start reacting. That We've got a job to go to Washington, straighten it out, and then we've got a, got a, a commitment to come back home and live under the laws that we, let, that, that we passed or the budgets that we did. And that's what we've, we've got to make a fundamental change of sending people up there with that attitude. So uh, that's one of the things that I want to do as a, as a U.S. Senator. You know, there was a guy named, a French philosopher named Tocqueville that come here in the 1800s to discover what the greatness of America was. He wanted to find out what made America great. And so he went out into the agricultural fields of America, went through the corn fields, the grain fields, looked at the farming facilities, but he didn't find the greatness of America there. He went into the institu institutions of higher learning, the colleges, the schools, all across America, but he didn't find the greatness of America there. He went into the factories of America and saw the production, the ability of America to produce and work, but he didn't find the greatness of America there. He went to the marbled halls of Congress and all of our national monuments looking for the greatness of America, but guess what? He didn't find the greatness of America there. He finally found the greatness of America when he went into the churches of America and saw her pulpits flame with righteousness. He says the greatness of America is, is here. 
America is great because America is good. When America ever ceases to be good, America will cease to be great. Well, what we've got to do, we realize where the greatness of America is. The greatness of America is right here with you and every one of you coming here today and expressing your love for this country. That, that is the greatness of America. It's not Washington, D.C. Washington, D.C. should reflect what we are as a country and as Americans. You know, I want to leave you, I want to leave you a little, with a little story. I like to look back on history. I love to study the Civil War. I want to leave you with a story that I think, and this is the attitude that each one of us has to have. But it was the spring of 1862. Grant's army had been in the Battle of Shiloh and he'd been defeated. He'd been driven back to the banks of the Tennessee River. Grant was sitting out in front of his tent. You know, you can just see him now with that old smoky, soggy cigar sitting in front of his tent. And Sherman that writes in his memoirs that he was going to go to Grant and de suggest defeat and to retreat. And so Sherman goes to Grant's tent and Sherman walks along the Tennessee River and there's thousands of soldiers, you know, and it's a cold rain is falling. They're huddled along the banks and he, he walks up to Grant and he said, they beat us today. And Grant looked him dead in the eye and said, yep, lick them tomorrow though. Well, Sherman decided not to go to phase two of the discussion and suggest retreat. They then sat down and in the long run, they, wanted, they had one of the key conversations of the entire Civil War because they realized what had to be done. Up until that time, the Civil War generals had trained and trained and went out and fought one big battle and was defeated and then they went home to train again. What Grant discovered was is the South was sincerely serious about becoming free. And that faced with an enemy that was willing to die for what they believed in, the only way you could defeat that enemy was to fight one bloody battle after another, day after day after day after day. Grant was the first general to realize what it was going to take to win the Civil War. And that was a, a, a every day, going out and fighting for what you believe in. So that's why Grant rose to the top. So they brought him east, and he got involved in one of his first big fights. It was the Battle of the Wilderness. And he gave a lot of casualties, and he took a lot of casualties. And after three days of fighting, Grant's army sat and watched General Grant. And he got up that morning, he got on his horse, and he rode out, and he turned his horse south. And the men began to cheer. Even though it meant that another fight was coming, they didn't mind fighting if there was a point to it. We have to, as a country, have to realize that none of our enemies, are the well-meaning well liberals, are ever going to voluntarily quit. They're never going to say, please, oh please, take away my programs, take away my bureaucracy, take away all my big government programs. They're never going to say that. It's up to us every day to go out and fight for what we believe in. It's not a fight that you go out and fight every two years in an election. It's a fight that you go out every day for what you believe in and stand up for your principles and you fight it day after day after day after day because that's what they've been doing. They have outwore us. So now what we have to do is we have to get involved in the battle. A long time there's been a lot of us that have sat on the sidelines and we've watched as our team's been taking a terrific beating. But right now is the time for you to enter the battle. And what you do is you go out and win the hearts and the minds and the souls of America with better ideas. Ideas that work. You don't attack and tear down your opponents because you can offer better ideas. Ideas that made this country great. So I want to thank you for coming here today, and I want to, I want to encourage you to continue to enter the battle to, for, the, for the hearts and minds of America and win this country back. So thank you very much.